Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel, comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. Simon Says, The John Simon Thriller, Book One by Brian Thomas Schmidt. Master Detective John Simon is a tough, streetwise 17-year veteran of the Kansas City Police Department with a healthy disdain for the encroachment of modern technology into his workplace. When his partner is kidnapped after a routine stakeout by thugs with seeming ties to connected, wealthy art dealer Benjamin Ashman, he's determined to find the truth. But the only witness is a humanoid android named Lucas George. Reluctantly, he takes Lucas along as he begins to investigate and soon finds himself depending more and more on the very technology he so distrusts. Meanwhile, Simon's precocious teenage daughter begins to teach Lucas how to sound more like a cop using dialogue from famous cop movies. If only he'd use them in the appropriate context. This exciting new mix of near-future science fiction and procedural thriller captures the gritty realism of Michael Connelly's Bosch, the humor and action of Lethal Weapon, and follows the classic science fiction tradition of Isaac Asimov's City of Steel. From the editor of the international best-selling phenomenon The Martian by Andy Weir and the national best-selling author of tales including official entries in The X-Files, Predator, and the Joe Ledger thrillers comes the action-packed first entry in an exciting new series. Be sure to pick up Simon Says by Brian Thomas Schmidt and get into the series on the ground floor. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure a bloodhound with a terrifying past who'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi. A cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic. Delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. 
survivor, mother, leader, and humanity's last chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Rachel Levy Lesser on the show with me today. She's got a fantastic new book. When you're hearing this, the book came out yesterday, and uh, that's uh, what we're recording, actually, on release day. Uh, this is such a fantastic book, Rachel. Um, uh, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, as you know, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, that's a good question for me. Let me just jump ahead, and then I'll backtrack to okay. the actual answer. I didn't officially become a professional writer as a career till about a little over 10 years ago um, when I turned 35. Uh, prior to that, I worked in marketing and PR. And prior to that, I went to business school. I studied history in college. So it didn't hit me till about 10 years ago that I actually had something to say that I could write about, that I could have some books in me and some stories to tell. But I will say going further back about just being a storyteller was probably in second grade. I remember doing a little booklet, like making a booklet out of, you know, paper and cardboard in Mrs. Moy's second grade class. Uh, the cool thing about Mrs. Moy's is that she had one of those clawfoot bathtubs in her classroom and you would sit in there and read, which is kind of random, but kind of cool. And, I had um, one of those same teachers in the sixth grade. It was oh, Miss, really, yes, that she had the clawfoot bathtub and it was full of like quilts that, uh, you know, her, her grandmother had knitted and yeah. it was, it was a magical place. Yeah. So I, I think about that bathtub every once in a while. So, you know, that was the first time I, I really put together a book in my messy second grade handwriting. And uh, from that point onward, I would say I was a storyteller in terms of creating little stories. I always had a big imagination and playing games and writing songs and doing things like that. But then, like I said, it took me kind of a long time as a grown up, maybe to figure out that that's what I actually could do professionally. Wow. Um, you said that uh, you didn't really get into professional writing until about 10 years ago. What, what, uh, what did you do in the meantime? In the meantime, I worked, it's funny, I worked in marketing and PR, but it's interesting because for most of my marketing career, I worked for magazines I worked for Time Inc. in New York City on some of my favorite magazines like People and InStyle and Real Simple. And so even though I was on the business side, I still definitely wanted to be around the written word yeah. and publications and writing um, and reading. That was always a big part of it. And then I did marketing and PR for smaller firms and freelance uh, for clients and things like that. Yeah, th just – just working around the business, um, you know, for a lot of people that that helps to scratch the itch. Um, do you feel like uh, did it fed into your want, uh, you know, more so to uh, to be a writer and to tell your own stories? 
I think so. Some of my favorite parts of that job, it definitely wasn't the Excel spreadsheets and running the numbers. (laughs) (laughs) It was more going through the research, doing the focus groups, seeing what people loved about the magazines, um, figuring out what parts of the magazines they like to read, and then sort of comparing that to what I thought. Right. Uh, speaking of focus groups, that that brings up an, an interesting thing that I think about sometimes. Uh, you know, when when you're telling a story, um, especially someone who's a novelist or maybe uh, is writing a memoir, um, there's there's a lot of time where it's just solitude. It's you and and the page. You're, you're the computer screen, uh, more likely. And you know, you don't get a lot of feedback from people until the end of the project. Um, how do you think about that uh, as someone who has, um, you know, polled people and gotten feedback and maybe helped to adjust plans based on that feedback? Then when you write your own project, um, do you think about how people are going to receive that? And, and does that affect the way that you plan out a new project? That's funny that you're asking me that question today because um... – My book just came out into the world and I feel I've been thinking a lot about sort of the dichotomy of the job of a writer where you exist for a while in solitude. And I write, you know, either in my home office or at Starbucks with my headphones in, I'm alone with my thoughts for a big chunk of the day for a long period of time. And then your book comes out in the world and you're hearing from all these people, especially now today's, you know, with PR and social media and you go from this, you know, all these thoughts and feelings existing in the vacuum of your head to everybody and their mother reading your book, hopefully. (laughs) So it is kind of a funny place to be. And I do think that in my process of writing, this is my fourth book, and I've gotten to kind of know my readers pretty well. Um, Hopefully I'm always adding new, newer readers and more readers, but I think that I kind of get a sense for what my voice is and for what it sounds like in other people's heads. So that's not to say that I'm writing for one specific person or that I am writing for anybody else other than the story that I want to tell, but there is a little bit of that back and forth in my head. Um, And everything I write makes sense to me, but before I put it out there in the world, I have to at least figure out how it will make some kind of sense to other people. Do you remember, Rachel, the first author, uh, the first book or the first series that just completely opened your mind uh, and and absorbed you into the book or story? Yeah, I mean, this is going way back to the Mrs. Moy's bathtub days, <laughs> but I was a big fan of Ramona Quimby and, you know, Beverly Clear. And that was like, I mean, I can I can picture so many parts of my childhood um, and comparing um, parts of Ramona's life to mine. Um, I remember they had a Chevrolet and she thought that was the most beautiful name of a car. And I was like, we have a Chevy station wagon too. (laughs) Just like little things like that. Always comparing myself to, um, characters in books. I could kind of escape in them. Do you, um, this is your fourth memoir, right? Uh, yes. That you've released? It's my fourth book. They're all nine nonfiction. One was a children's book, um, but they're all sort of memoir related. There's some piece of my life in there. This, I would say, is sort of the big tell all, if you want to put it that way, memoir. Not that it's a tell all, but you know what I mean? It's put it, as I say, um, when I've been putting some of my talks together at events, this is my fourth book. It's probably the one that I've had in me the longest, but I think I had to write the other ones first before I could dig deep and get this all out onto paper. When did you first encounter this form of writing? Um, it, it, it's it's so strange. You know, the, the majority of people that I talk to on the show are probably fiction writers, probably, you know, at least 80 percent. And, you know, we talk a lot about the the way that we all put ourselves and our stories at some point. It's usually not the, the places that readers think, you know, we we disguise ourselves and things like that. But it, especially first novels. They tend to really be biographical in 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 some way, um, and and we hide those. You know, we we try to disguise in, in different characters and things like that. Um, but when you're writing nonfiction, especially memoir, um, it is it's you and and all you. Um, when did you first kind of discover this way of writing and this style and this this medium, um, and uh, and what what led you there? Yeah, so um, it 
in some ways it's pretty clear cut to figure it out. My mom died right when I turned 30 and I had a new baby and she was in her fifties. And at that time I was working in marketing and PR and it was a, it was a really hard time uh, for me for obvious reasons. And it got really bad and I was sort of having trouble dealing with life. And I was talking to a therapist who my mother suggested I see before she died, which was very her. And the therapist at the time said to me, you know, I think you should start write, writing down some of your thoughts and feelings about your mom because you got to get this stuff out of you. Um, you know, it, it could be very therapeutic for you. And so I did. And I just, um, you know, I always sort of had a knack for writing. I knew that I was good at it. And so I started writing and writing and writing. And these journals sort of became the basis for my first book. So I would say, um, I said to you earlier, like I didn't turn to writing until I was well into my career, but I think I didn't feel that I had something to say perhaps until then, until after losing my mother and um, figuring out, you know, how that kind of fit into my life. Was that book, Who's Going to Watch My Kids? No, that was actually my first book called Shopping for Love. Okay. Who's, going, who's Going to Watch My Kids? Interestingly, it's it's a memoir in part, but it was also a research-based book. Um, in it, I interviewed women from all over the country um, and I asked them specifically about their relationships with their nannies that they employed so they could work outside of the home. And part of that was based on the 10 years that I employed many different nannies so that I could work outside of the home. And I noticed this common theme of the relationships between the nannies and the moms. It was unlike any other relationship in the workplace. And I had friends and colleagues that kept saying, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. So I thought there was story in, there was a story in there. One thing, uh, and and your your previous books have been a little more topical um so so maybe this is an easy question to answer there but one one thing that I'm that I always love to um to try to figure out uh in when I'm reading a memoir or you know some sort of nonfiction is is where the writer decides uh the the narrative thread is like how do you you're, you're taking real life experiences how do you decide where the beginning and where the ending of this is, especially for, for you, there's, you know, you've, you've had a lot of life experience, but there's a whole lot of life yet to come. Um, how do we isolate this window of time? Uh, and, and, you know, maybe if you're, if you're dealing with, you know, working mothers outside the home, maybe that kind of defines itself. Um, but when you're dealing with your own life, how do you decide where that narrative window is? Yeah, that is a really good question. And that was something that I think I struggled with. And that was maybe why this was my fourth book and not my first book. Um, and I will tell you in this book, Life's Accessories, it's called A Memoir and a Fashion Guide. And it's written in 14 essays, which can also be called chapters. And in some ways, the essays could stand independently, but they all do come together for the most part in chronological order to tell the story of my life. And I started out when I'm 13 years old and I went to this prep school where I felt completely left out and like the other and like I didn't know where I had landed um, until the modern day me, a 45 year old author and mom and wife and um, someone who'd lost my mom 15 years ago and is somehow happily surviving in the world quite self-actualized. And that's kind of what inspired me to write it. Like, how did I get here? So when I was going back to think about how I could structure this. I looked to these material objects in my closet or on my dresser, these fashion accessories, because I thought they could serve as an outline for the way I could tell these stories. I have this weird, like almost photographic memory for remembering everything that I wore <laughs> at every seemingly important event to me. And I thought it was an interesting um, way to to look at one's life and from the responses i've gotten so far from early readers you know people can relate to to the ups and downs of life to the getting their heart broken and losing people and finding your place and all those common themes but they can also relate to some of the very specific accessories like the kate spade bag or the scarf or the necklace and stuff like that so that's been fun to say the like you said the book is broken into a series of essays um which came first, the idea for this book and then the essays, or were these essays things you were writing um, along the way and, and discovered a, a connecting thread? Um, tell us about the planning of this book. Sure. Well, I would say about 85% of the material in the book is brand new. 
So I wrote it for the book. There are a couple essays in there. I want to say three of them where I had started them. Like there was a small part of it, perhaps in a blog post or for a publication that I had been writing for, but I took them and went with them. So as far as the planning of it, I went back and outlined how I could tell this coming of age story of me, because that's really what it is, a coming of age story up until now. I hope there's still more coming of age to be. <laughs> but um, so I went back and I and I mapped it out and I was and it, it came to me pretty easy in terms of finding the accessory that would be the focus of the chapter. And I didn't want it to feel forced at all. And I don't think it is. But there were some that never made it in and there were some I took out. You know, it was it was editing back and forth. And um, that's sort of how it came to be. But I'm really pleased with the way it came together. I do think it feels natural. And each essay is very different from the other in terms of it's not the same formula um, where I employ the accessory in there. It comes very naturally, I think, as a writer it came to me and I've heard as a reader it does, too. When you were working on that first book that was published, Shopping for Love, um, what was the, what was your experience um, getting that book out out to the rest of the world? I know you were you were working in magazine publishing uh, at the time. Did did working in that industry help you to um, kind of have an idea of what that process would be like? And w were there any surprises along the way? Yeah. So actually, to be a little more specific, at the time that I was writing that first book, I was not in magazine publishing. I was working for a smaller marketing firm gotcha. and doing marketing and research and branding for um, for a smaller company. But I did have that magazine experience with me. I did have the contacts of the people that I'd worked with at the magazines who at that point had been, some were still at Time Inc. and some had moved on to other magazines. So that was really helpful. Um, I will say in terms of uh, having books out in the world, there are some authors, we talked a little bit about this before, you know, who, who love that quiet, that sitting in solitude, that writing. And I do like that, but I also draw a lot of energy from other people, from getting my book out in the world, from the PR. I mean, I have a, fa a fabulous publicity team right now, but I love doing a lot of PR myself. I, I love um, talking to people. I love putting things out there in interesting ways and not just doing you know, specific book talks at bookstores, which I love to do too, but I like doing other kinds of things. So I think the the experience in working in magazine publishing and in PR too helped me to get these books out into the world. When you're when you're writing um, about yourself, or at least where you show up as a character in in some of the stories, um, you know, one interesting thing about memoir is is that it's not always just you. It's it's your experience with other people and other situations. Uh, what is it like for the people around you uh, when you're working on a new book? Mm, I'm smiling because first <laughs> I think of my husband who I'm definitely the social butterfly of the two of us and he is much more private and he's obviously in this book, but he had to um, approve all parts. <laughs> he sort of <laughs> cringes when he's written about. So he's definitely the one that comes first. And I did, um, particularly with this book, email out an early version of the manuscript to a few of the people that I call the main characters in the book who also just happen to be main characters in my life to get their approval. Um, and I would say I'm probably harder on myself than I am on other people. I will also say there are stories of, of um, sort of side characters and I change names, things that happen to me. And, you know, from everybody I spoke to, everybody said, you know what, it's all good to go. You're not going to you know, offend anyone, you're being as honest as you can be. And that was really important to me to get people's approval as well. Gotcha. Uh, one thing I was, uh, I, I won't say I was surprised, but I was, uh, I was happy to see um, just how funny this book is. Uh, and it's not all, you know, just, you know, rib splitting laughter, um, but it's, it's really wry and, uh, and a lot of sharp humor. Um, how important is humor to you um, when you're, especially when you're dealing with things that might be, um, you know, tough to, to look back on or, um, you know, that, that may hit people emotionally deep. Uh, but the laughter to me, um, you know, helps to, um, to, to see those things, uh, you know, as not hopeless or, or whatever. How, how important is, is humor uh, when telling, you know, a personal story? 
humor is so important to me. And I think there's a fine line between using humor, you know, using the serious stuff. And I think that's part of my writing. At least that's what I've heard from other people. And I think it's sometimes maybe perhaps in conversation or in my writing, sometimes the way that I employ humor within the context perhaps of something like anxiety or grief or illness may surprise people at first, but then I think people really like it. Um, I think in some ways I have done the hard work and dug deep and dealt with losing my mom, dealing with other sad, tough things in life, but I can be funny and lighthearted because I have done that hard work. And I've met other people like that, and we sort of relate to each other in that way. Uh, your other books have been uh, more specific, um, you know, dealing with a, a certain event or a certain um, you know, uh, part of life or, or, or situational. Um, this book, like you said earlier, is more of a coming of age story. And you said that you had to you had to wait to be able to write this book. Um, how do you see this book and, and how do you see the way it tells your journey? Um, well, I could not have written this book 10 years ago. I couldn't have written 20 years ago and I probably couldn't have e even written it five years ago. It's funny that you mentioned fiction before because uh, prior to getting involved in all the PR for this book, I have been working on a little bit of a outline for a fiction book because I don't think there's anything left to tell about myself and I'm kind of sick of myself at this point. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said in, um, you know, telling your story and other people's stories through fictionalizing characters. But as far as writing this book in the process of outlining this fiction book, I realized that I still had more in me to tell. And I felt like I had to go back and tell this coming of age story before I could get anything else out in the world. And I think it really, I really went back and wrote it because I kind of alluded to this before. I sort of woke up one day and was like, hey, I'm like this happy middle-aged self-actualized woman. And I used to be a total mess when I had a new baby, when my mother had just died, I was just kind of going through the motions. And there's a lot of funny stuff in there about it when I was trying to like make new friends and trying to figure out just how to become a grown up adult in the world. And I thought to myself, I think there's a story in here to tell, um, you know, from sort of the person I used to be the, to the person I got to be. And then also I went further back, like I said, back to when I was 13 years old. And I thought if I could tell this story completely in chronological order that other people could relate to it. And I hope that's what, that's what happens. I don't know if that answers your question. Sure. Yeah. Um, in, in fiction writing, we, we tend to, um, and unfairly, uh, most of the time uh, divide writers into two different camps, planners and, and pantsers or people that write by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, that's unfair for most people because uh, most people are somewhere in the middle. Um, but you know, this is a completely different, uh, animal and this was, uh, you know, planned on, on purpose. You, you went into this book, you said, I think 80% of it is, is all new material. So you went into this with a, with a purpose and with an end goal in sight. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your planning process when you're dealing with a book like this. Uh, it's 14 essays and you know that it's going to cover, you know, uh, from, from this point to this point, um, how do you begin to break that up and to plan out how the book is going to take shape? It's funny. I am a pretty big planner in life and in writing and everything. So for this book, I outlined it as it was actually more than 14 essays, but I, I cut some and I had a pretty good sense of, you know, the chapter by chapter, essay by essay, but I will say, and in some essays more so than others, I started out with one concept and ended it with another. So like you said, there most writers are somewhere in the middle. I am a planner, but when I sit down and write, I really, you know, do it sort of free flow and I just see where, see where it takes me. And I don't go back and edit for a while because I want to see what's out there. I usually write more than I need and then I go back and take it out or I bring another part in. So I don't let the planning get in the way of my creative process. Gotcha. Um, do you uh, do you have a specific um, uh, like outlining technique of, of 
the way you lay out the kind of the big picture ideas that you're then going to get in and, and free form right in? Yeah, I've never been one who sticks to those, um, you know, software programs of outline. My outlines are basically legal pads, little scribbles of paper in my bag, on my dresser, on my desk. And then I will go into like Microsoft Word, very high tech, I know. And, you know, chapter one, couple thoughts, get it out there, chapter two, et cetera. And I mentioned I've outlined and even started to write a fiction book, which is totally new for me. And I'm really excited about it, actually. I'm excited to get back to it in some period of time because I, I feel a little bit like writing fiction is like going back to play with these characters in my head and I kind of miss them. <laughs> um, so that outlining is different. And, you know, I'm sure fiction writers could tell you this. I have a plan, but I, I know it will be different because I'm keeping track of so many different characters and dialogues and things like that. So that's going to be a little trickier. How do you, um, I, I know a memoir is, is your recollection of things and, and the way that you, uh, have experienced this through your eyes and your, uh, you know, your personal experience. Um, but, you know, fiction writers, we like to take something that happened and then embellish that. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you, do, do you ever have a, you know, experience a situation say, oh, this would be great to write someday? Um, do you journal things? Uh, like, are there things that you use to, to help you stay crisp on the details? Yeah, I have a really good memory. It's weird. I mean, it's um, it's funny. I got an email yesterday from my aunt and uncle, who I'm very close to, and they found a picture of our whole family together at Thanksgiving. And they said to me in the email, what year was this? And I said, 1988. And they said, how do you remember that? First of all, my grandfather's birthday was always on Thanksgiving, so I did remember that. I said, uh, not surprisingly, I remember the headband and I remember the skirt and where I got them and why I wore them and what year it was and you know, I was, I was a teenager, but, um, so I, I do have a good memory when I do go through an experience. Now I think about how I can write an essay about it. Another, a thought came to me the other day, actually, when I was driving my son to school about something. So I will go down and write it on my computer somewhere and keep it there for a potential essay for, or for an idea, perhaps in my next book. But in a memoir like that, like this one in life's accessories, where I would go back and revisit stuff. You know, this, the essays that I write and the memories in them and the lessons learned are so important and poignant to me that I can remember the very specific details. And like you said, it is my memory. It's, it's real to me. I remember it happening that way. Um, Other people have corroborated with me that it happened that way. I'm sure, you know, there's, there's a story I'm just thinking right now, when I got this horrible perm when I was 13 and my brother was in the backseat of the car with me, he may remembered a different way, but I'm pretty sure he remembers me being pretty upset. So, um, so stuff like that. I'm just, you know, I, I guess I have a good memory. I do write things down, but I think for everyone, memory's funny that way. And actually there is an essay in this book called the happy scarf in memory. And it's about a very specific day that I spent with my mother in New York now, 16 years ago. And part of the gist of the essay is that my mother gave me that day because she knew I would remember it. And it's funny how your memory works that I can go and revisit this happy day and this happy scarf when I need it in the same sense that I guess people can revisit a, a sad time uh, for whatever reason they need, they need to see it. But I think people tend to remember the things that touch them, whether it's, it seems big to you. Um, it was definitely big to them. Um, the book goes, uh, you said, you know, you have this, this great memory and you can remember what you were wearing uh, you know, when, when certain things happen, um, this book really goes a step farther and, and even in the title, you know, a memoir and fashion guide, um, how do those memories of what you're wearing and how the, the, the clothes and the accessories, uh, affected you and, you know, had some, some part to play, um, how does that play into the book? And at what point did, did, did you realize that that was going to be a key component to how the story was told? Well, I wanted to tell this coming of age story and I had all these lessons to share and, you know, funny memories and sad memories, but I felt like I needed something to help me do it and not just tell it. And that's where the accessories came in. So before I even um, outlined the stories, I had the accessories in mind. So it was very important for me. 
it served as an outline and a framework. It was sort of like my boss in a way. It was what I could use to tell the stories. And I think particularly women, I know some men too, but particularly women are very attached to some of the things they wore or have in their jewelry box. I know for some of these book events that I have coming up, I'll often wear the accessory that I talk about. When I'm doing something where I feel like I need my mom with me, I'll wear a piece of her jewelry. And I talk to people about that all the time. They're always said, oh, did my grandmother's here with me today, or this my husband gave me for this, or this I bought on this trip. And um, I think we all have a lot of connections to some of the material objects in our closets and on our dressers. Absolutely. The the book is Life's Accessories, a memoir and fashion guide. It is out everywhere now in uh, paperback and Kindle edition. Uh, wherever you buy books, the the, uh, the book is available there. Uh, Rachel, this has been so much fun talking. Uh, if people are just learning about you, is there a place they can connect with you online? Yeah, well, first of all, they can go to my website, rachellevylesser.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter under um, Rachel Levy Lesser. And on Twitter and Instagram, it's Rachel Levy Lesser. Excellent. We're going to link all of that in the show notes and obviously uh, link the book Life's Accessories in there. Uh, Rachel, we wish you much success on the book launch today, and uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch? The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night, give me your answer. Which one would Mom kill us for watching? said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, Child of the Jackal? The Omen! And we might have time for Omen too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil. Born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. But he could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any. And Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about, hmm, 
scary blackout. Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? he whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 